We're seeing a massive trend in the crypto space where entire countries are exploring you know, major overhauls to their financial infrastructure. We've recently seen El Salvador pass legislation to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. We're seeing a general trend towards interest in central bank digital currencies. And in this video, I want to talk about a couple big leaps forward in this direction, particularly for the Ethereum platform. I want to talk about all this as a blockchain developer who works this technology on a daily basis. So before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm that really helps these videos out because YouTube is like based on engagement. So just go ahead and smash that like button. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so more people learn about blockchain. And if you want to become a blockchain master step-by-step start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. So we're seeing a huge shift in how entire countries think about their monetary infrastructure. We've seen, like I said, a huge trend towards central bank digital currencies and also, you know, countries that adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. El Salvador recently passed this bill, and we're seeing lots of other countries express strong interest in central bank digital currencies, and a lot of them are trying to figure out, you know, how are they going to implement this. And one of the latest pieces of news in this arena is the Bank of Israel testing Ethereum tech and digital shekel trial. So I actually got the opportunity to go talk about this on Around the Blockchain on the BitBoy Crypto channel with the Bit Squad. So go check out that video if you haven't already subscribed to their channel for sure. And I talked about this yesterday in my live stream that we do, you know, every Monday through Friday here on this channel just turn on the notifications down below to find out about those when we go live. But I want to make this in-depth video to talk about this more and what this means about how they're going to implement this. So let's actually just jump into the article and he- see what they have to say. So the Bank of Israel is trying out Ethereum's technology in a recently launched internal digital shekel trial. So why are they doing this? Well, in May, they released a report that says it could have a positive impact on the economy by simplifying payment process while providing security to both parties in a transaction. So that's a big benefit of blockchain technology here is the efficiency and also the security. So they're saying that the bank also put out a call for smart application ideas that could run on top of the digital infrastructure. So this is pretty huge. And we don't have a ton of information on here on exactly what's going to happen with this and what all the details are. There's still going to be quite a bit of speculation around this, but there's still some conclusions that we can draw. And so I want to talk about those right now. So the first big conclusion that we can draw from this is basically just major validation for blockchain technology on the whole. So when you have a country like this actually wanting to experiment with digital currency, it goes way beyond just like speculative hype for cryptocurrency currencies and about what it could potentially do in the future. Now, it is early and this is still experimental, but the fact that we've reached this level of experimentation is absolutely insane compared to where we were even just a year ago. And so when cryptocurrency prices have fallen like they have over the past, you know, month and a half, two months, and it's kind of got a lot of people down and bearish and like, oh, what's going to happen with blockchain long term? You know, people ask me why I'm still bullish on this space. I got actually asked about this on the, uh, you know, interview we did for around the blockchain on BitBoy's channel. And my number one reason is technological innovation and actual really solid use cases for the technology itself. And that's always the long-term thesis on this channel is as you provide more you know, value with blockchain technology that gives more people reason to hold cryptocurrencies themselves. And that value can accrue to the cryptocurrency prices because ultimately they're based upon supply and demand. Sure, there can be speculative bubbles along the way, some hype where the prices get overinflated and then boom and bust, of course, but that exponential trend can still continue onward. And when you see, you know, central banks coming in to create currencies like this, that's just even more validation for the technology and solid use cases, why people might want to use it in the first place. So now while this is a huge validation for blockchain technology, it's also a lot of validation for a specific piece of blockchain technology, which is Ethereum, because that's what they're doing here. They've chosen Ethereum to launch this pilot project on. So why is that important? Well, out of everything they looked that they could potentially build this on, they chose Ethereum for a reason. And this is a trend that we're seeing emerge. And that's one of the reasons I focus on it so much on this channel where I focus my expertise is because they're seeing the same types of things that I've been talking about for years on this channel, which is exactly what you can do with Ethereum compared to the alternatives that are out there today. We've seen this with crypto partnering with Visa to actually launch payment solutions where Ethereum is the payment rails. It actually settles the transaction on top of the blockchain. It doesn't actually just cash crypto out of your app, convert it into fiat and use the old rails. It actually uses blockchain underneath the hood. Same type of thing for a digital currency like this for for a major nation. Ethereum is a public blockchain that's widely distributed. It's got a ton of users, a strong developer ecosystem. It's got support for smart contracts that make it easy to launch your own cryptocurrency on top of it and actually take advantage of all the smart applications and all the innovation that's taken place on top of the platform so far. And I think that's reflected in the reasons that they gave on why they're eyeing this solution in the first place. They talked about, you know, the benefits they can get from blockchain technology, like the efficiency and security. You get both of those things with Ethereum and also the, the 
hope to build smart apps, which you can do with smart contracts on top of the Ethereum platform right now. Now, again, we don't have a ton of details on the actual implementation on this, how it's going to work, you know, whether this is going to be ERC-20 token. I think that it probably will be because that's a, a widely adopted standard for how cryptocurrencies work in the first place. We don't know if users are going to have, you know, wallets themselves. There's, there's still lots of things that we don't know about this. This is still really early. And we don't even know if this is going to be the long-term solution yet. But these are just some insights that we can, you know, try to draw from the, the speculation based on the limited information that we have. So those are all the good things, but let's actually talk about some objections for people who have their skeptics hat on and say, hmm, something doesn't quite add up here with some of these things. So let's start off with the number one big objection that I've heard people talk about, which are the fees on Ethereum. Like, how are you going to make a central bank digital currency where people like have to hold an Ethereum wallet and pay these massive gas fees and also do really slow transaction times? You know, Ethereum's not ready for the scale of that type of thing yet. So there are a couple of things here. So number one, we are about to move towards layer two scaling solutions on top of Ethereum, where we actually create a second layer where a lot of the computation can take place. And then the final result is settled back on Ethereum. That's going to help the speed and the fees on Ethereum considerably without all of Ethereum 2.0 having to ship. So we are on a roadmap towards Ethereum 2.0 coming out towards the end of this year, beginning of next year, at least with proof of stake uh, getting merged into the main Ethereum chain right now. We'll still have sharding a little bit farther down the road from that. But the whole point is you're going to get this speed and scalability benefit very soon on the grand scheme of things compared to when all of Ethereum 2.0 has to ship. And so that can greatly reduce the fee problem. But honestly, with a central bank digital currency, I have a feeling that some of these experiments will be greatly simplified for the user. And they probably won't be just holding their own Ethereum wallets. They'll probably use Ethereum for the settlement layer and still have some sort of interface that abstracts it away from the everyday user. And a lot of people say, hey, that's not really in the spirit of blockchain technology. I'll get to that in a minute on, you know, whether central bank digital currencies are a good thing or a bad thing. But that's what I think will probably happen for these initial projects. And so if you think about it that way, you think of a lot of the blockchain user experience uh, being abstracted away from the user or hidden from the user, then that can actually help with the fee problem. So you might say like, hey, nobody's going to pay a $1 fee for a transaction. And with layer twos, they won't be that much. But like, let's just say someone's not going to add on a few cents even every time they sent, you know, a transaction. Well, people already do this. So people aren't going to pay those extra fees if they're itemized every time they make a transaction. But anytime you use a credit card at a merchant at a point of sale, you're always paying these fees. It's just that they're not itemized at the point of sale where you can see them, okay? So if you go to a merchant, you swipe your credit card, there's usually like a two-ish percent fee that's getting you know paid by the merchant. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that cost is really getting passed back onto the consumer. You might look at it as like, oh, the merchant eats that fees. Well, it's not really true. Uh, you know, the consumer ultimately eats that fees in an increased price for their product itself. And so you can see a similar type of thing happen with central bank digital currencies where the fees are essentially hidden from the user. They're abstracted away. But the user or the person who really needs the benefit of the technology is paying those fees. But the end user doesn't really see them every time they make a transaction. And so the other big objection I'm going to hear about this uh, inevitably, and I've even thought about this a lot myself, I've talked about on my channel is, hey, you know, the essential bank digital currencies, are they really in the spirit of blockchain technology in the first place, right? You know, if, if the spirit of something like Bitcoin, for example, is a peer to peer digital cash system that's borderless, you know, that's a decentralized cryptocurrency, then a central bank digital currency is kind of the opposite of that. I mean, even, even the name implies it itself, a centralized, you know, cryptocurrency. So I think that is true. And there's multiple opinions on this, whether CBDCs are actually good for the cryptocurrency space or they're bad. So one opinion is that they're good in the sense that they give legitimacy to crypto. They see the real need for it. And it's a way of sort of bridging into that ecosystem and, it, you know, acknowledging that it's inevitable and that you have to compete in some way. And this is your answer to it. And that if you as long as that happens and lets, you know, all these decentralized alternatives exist, then people have the option of using something that's decentralized versus something that's centralized in this case. So that's sort of the best of both worlds, in my opinion. But I think it's true that something that's very centralized like this is kind of antithetical to, you know, the, the whole crypto ethos to begin with. But at the end of the day, I do think that central bank digital currencies are an inevitability at this point. We've seen this entire trend explode like crazy. Lots of different countries are talking about how they want to explore this. I think at the end of the day, the question is, how are they going to get implemented? So I actually watched an interview with Raul Paul recently. I can't remember exactly where it was. Maybe you can search for it on YouTube and find it. But he was talking about how he thinks there's a lot of incentives for, you know, the central bank digital currencies essentially to use 
you know, existing infrastructure out there, you know, built by the private sector. So in this case, public blockchains for lots of reasons. Okay. And, you know, one reason is just having to create the entire infrastructure yourself will be an insane task for a central bank. Now, that being said, if you wanted to create some sort of central bank digital currency that wasn't truly decentralized in any way, then I guess it wouldn't matter as much. You could just spin up a bunch of nodes that were, you know, centralized. But if we're actually going to do this in the spirit of blockchain technology, where there's at least some benefit of transparency, then leveraging public blockchain infrastructure that exists already would provide a ton of huge benefits. And while you could still have some sort of centralized issuance with these cryptocurrencies, still some degree of control over how they work, there's still this added benefit of transparency, okay? And this is something that I think gets a lot of people hung up. They talk about decentralized finance or DeFi not really being being uh, decentralized, that people hold admin keys, you know, all this type of stuff where there's all these central points of failure. That's totally true. And decentralization is definitely a spectrum. Some things to be more decentralized or less decentralized. But even if you're kind of somewhere on that spectrum and there's some central points of failure, there's still this big benefit of transparency and that all the activity on the chain is actually public and you can audit what everybody does so that if someone acts, you know, dishonestly, then you have a record of that. It's not a completely closed system where you can't audit anybody's behavior or anything like that. So if we do have, you know, central banks issuing digital currencies to public blockchains, sure, there could be some central control, but you still get this benefit of transparency by using that existing infrastructure. And that's still a benefit that I could see to this particular solution. So let me know what you think down below. Is this a good thing for crypto? Is this a bad thing for crypto? That's all I got for today. You know, as always, smash that like button down below. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so the more people can learn about blockchain. You know, if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? You can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a massive shortcut entirely, you know, I can show you how to become a blockchain master step-by-step -step, start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash boot camp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.